morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning CEO Radio Show. I am really glad to be your host today. Um, actually, every Saturday, I guess I'm really glad to be your host. I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of info of where you can actually watch us if you're just listening to us. Uh, if you're listening to us here on AM 1620, then you're probably uh, in the parking lot of the uh, college. No, actually, in the uh, St. Incentive area, you're listening to us on AM 1620. Or if you're in Europe, hi, Europe. You're listening to us on satellite radio, uh, parts of Africa, we've heard also, are uh, picking us up out there. Or you can listen to us live on the computer there, or on your phone, smradio.org slash audio. If you'd like to watch us and see our pretty faces today, then you can watch us on uh, in Riverside County, California, on Verizon Fios, channel 45, and Time Warner Cable, channels 0 and 126. Or you can pop on your computer at smradio.org slash YouTube and watch us. We're streaming live right now. We've got a steady stream going. And if you want to just uh, read about us as we ro rock and roll along here, uh, my assistant MJ is uh, tweeting live. We have a live Twitter stream going on smradio.org slash tweet. And you can actually uh, post questions on there if you'd like, or just follow along with uh, what's going on with the show. So glad to have you here this uh, happy Saturday morning. Today, my co-host is none other than my own brother in in crime, or brother in business, or brother in something, Mr. Maurice Domino, who is uh, the internationally, I'd say, uh, galactically known. <laughs> a speaker and trainer. Uh, he is uh, absolutely incredible. Been to his workshops, and he helps you discover what your million-dollar message is. So welcome, Maurice. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Dennis. So glad to be here on the Saturday Morning CEO. Fantastic day to start the Labor Day weekend right here at work. <laughs> absolutely. A little bit of labor on Labor Day. Who'd have thought? <laughs> well, you've been one of our guests who has actually been out to the studio here, so uh, we appreciate you making that long drive out from L.A. Uh, what was your experience being out here? Uh, let me tell you something. When I did the show and I drove on out there, what a fantastic experience. If you ever have the, the opportunity and the time <laughs> to, to drive on out there, I highly recommend it. Uh, the show that uh, Sandra and Dennis puts on Fantastic, fantastic studios, fantastic time. So, uh, Dennis, thank you so very much. You're welcome. Yeah, you were our very first Saturday morning television show guest, so we're glad to have you. Now, uh, before we introduce our guests, I want to have, have you let our uh, listeners and viewers know, what have you got anything coming up anytime soon, or, or how can folks uh, get in touch with you? Uh, well, thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. Yes, I do a signature event twice a year every spring and fall here in Los Angeles. It's called Discover Your Million Dollar Message Intensive. In fact, I have another one coming up the weekend of October 18th, 19th, and 20th. Uh, and if they go to my website, you see it there, uh, mauricedemino.com. You get all the information. And if I may, uh, as my way of saying thank you, uh, use uh, sat Saturday morning. Uh, Saturday morning as your discount code and get 50% off and come join us with one of your guests. I would love to see all the listeners of Saturday morning uh, CEO join us October 18th, 19th, and 20th. Oh, you're wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, let me uh, do a little introduction here. This is uh, our guest today is someone that I actually love having on the show. We had him on once before and I think we spoke for about three hours in the one-hour show. Uh, we had so much information that we just had to have him back. Mr. Michael Stevenson is an expert in NLP. If you have no idea what NLP is, well, let me just explain it to you really quick. It's Neuro Linguistic Programming. There you go. That explains it. Uh, <laughs> we'll ask him to explain it for us a little bit. But uh, it is uh, something that I like to dabble in uh, as a, a avid hobbyist. And uh, we're going to have him explain a little bit how uh, NLP can uh, help you in your life to become a little more successful and deal with life a little bit better. Michael, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you back. Thanks so much, Dennis and Maurice. I'm, having, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Great. Have a blast. Excellent. Well, yeah, we do have a little bit of fun on this show, and that's the whole purpose of this show is to be able to take some serious topics and uh, have fun with it so that everybody can enjoy it. So tell us what NLP is, other than three letters from the alphabet. 
Well, uh, put as simply as possible, NLP is the study of the mind. Um, you know, we have other fields that study the mind, like psychology, but um, you know, a lot of those other fields study illness and disorder. NLP has studied the mind for the better part of 50 years now, studying what makes people do things well. How do people do excellence? And so it really is a, it's a process of modeling. It's a, a technology of modeling and finding out what people do, not only physically when they do things well, but what do they do in their mind. So take someone like a Michael Jordan, for instance. Michael Jordan was a great basketball player, but was he a great basketball player because he was the tallest? No, he wasn't a very tall basketball player. Was he the fastest? No. Was he the strongest? He was kind of a smaller guy compared to some of the other basketball players. There was something about him that made him different. Even though he did all the same drills as everyone else, even though he did all the same practice and, and went through all the same steps, there was something about him that set him head and shoulders above everyone else. And what, what we study is the mindset behind that. What is it that makes people different? Why do we have people like Einstein's and Walt Disney's and Thomas Edison's and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs? The, you know, the list goes on and on. We know all these names um, because they stand head and shoulders above everyone else. And that's really what NLP studies. It's, it's, uh, it's been a wild journey for me over the last 15 years studying what makes people tick and how the mind works. You know, that, that's an important point is that we get to see the, the results of what happens in somebody's mind. You know, we get to see what Einstein did. We get to see the end product from all these people. So I think it's great that people are studying what is it that, that brings that out because each of us, I think, have that potential to become whatever we want if we follow the same pattern, if we know what that is. Exactly. So what, what was it that got you... Uh, started in NLP? Well, long story short, 15 years ago, I uh, quit smoking. I quit a horrible smoking habit, three, three packs a day, using a hypnosis tape that I bought at the Orange County Fair. And I was so intrigued by that because I've been trying for years to quit smoking. Nothing would work. I felt like I was hopelessly addicted. By the way, three packs of cigarettes, about 60 cigarettes a day. That's a cigarette every 10 to 15 minutes. And... Um, so I picked up this tape and I listened to it and I just woke up in the morning and never had another cigarette again. Cigarettes literally disappeared out of my life. Never had a craving, never had a withdrawal. I've never been tempted to go back. Matter of fact, um, one week from today, uh, actually it's next Friday, is my 15 year anniversary of quitting smoking. And I was so fascinated by that because I didn't believe in hypnosis. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just goofy stuff that we see on stage. And um, it's for me to just pop in a tape and quit smoking fascinated me. So in my study of the subconscious mind and trying to figure out what hypnosis was, I came across neuro-linguistic programming, which is actually far more powerful and, and um, not only makes longer lasting change, but works quicker. I mean, oftentimes five to 10 minutes is all it takes to overcome a problem just like that. That's interesting because I, you know, I thought that, uh, that um, hypnosis was kind of like, uh, just pretend like, the wrestlers, you know, they really <laughs> pretended to get out there, but it, but it really works, huh? Yeah, yeah, it worked for me, and, and uh, you know, since then, I, I ended up uh, pursuing that as a career. I became a certified clinical hypnotherapist. I've helped countless people quit smoking and lose weight and, and do better in business and, and, you know, help people have better beliefs about things like uh, business success and abundance, and, you know, it works for such a huge range of things. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. But the problem is most people see, you know, those stage shows, at the county fair, which I, I love the stage shows. They're fun to watch, but it gives people the impression that hypnosis is something that it isn't. And um, so, you know, NLP, one of the things they did is they modeled or they studied one of the world's greatest hypnotherapists who was getting, um, you know, he was just getting phenomenal results with his clients, but he was doing something different than other psychiatrists were. He was hypnotizing people in his office. And uh, so that's, a, that's how sort of NLP and hypnosis came together. And Michael, if I may ask a question, sure. You know, and, on, on the total basis of neural linguistic programming, and just on this total base, neural linguistic, how I read, how my reading that is, talking your way into success, talking your way into a new, uh, a new neural pathway. Yeah. I guess that's what hypnosis is. Is that that uh, you know, like you said, you listen to a tape, linguistics, uh, talking your way into it. Uh, is that too a too simplistic view of NLP? It's, it isn't, actually. You know, a big part of NLP is language, and the language that we use with ourselves and the language we use with other people. 
And what most people think is that their language describes their reality. What most people don't realize is your language actually dictates your reality. So if I can give you a quick example of that, you know, um, just from a CEO's perspective, from a business perspective, the definition of, of an entrepreneur is really simple. So let me give you an example of this. Think of a problem that you have in your life, whatever, whatever problem it is. Um, you know, it could be, could be a personal problem, could be a business problem, doesn't matter. But think of a problem that you have in your life and notice what it is like in your head. Um, as you think about it, notice what it looks like. Notice what it feels like in your body when you think about it. Notice the emotions that are present. Now, clear the screen for a second. Just white out your screen. Pretend that you're not thinking about anything now. And now what I want you to do is I want you to think about that same situation in your life, but I want you to think about it as a challenge. Okay. Call it a challenge. Notice what, what happens to you, Maurice, when you think of, a, of a, something you would have called a problem and you think of it as a challenge. What does it do? How does it change? Uh, what it does to me is that uh, I, I see me going for it. I see me leaning forward. I see me, you know, uh, climbing that mountain, going over adversity. So it, instead of being a problem where I'm taking a back seat to it, it's bigger than me. Uh, using the word challenge, all of a sudden the dynamics change. At least the graphics or the picture in my head now I'm bigger uh, than than what's in front of me, and I, I see me going past that obstacle. Literally, me jumping over that hurdle. Yeah. So now that you you know you've changed the linguistic, you've actually changed the language that you use to describe it. It doesn't just change. It doesn't just change the label that we use. It actually changes your experience of it. And what we say in NLP is that's actually changing your reality. It's changing the way that you actually experience that thing itself. Now, clear the screen. And what I want you to do is I want you to think of that same situation now, but instead of a challenge, call it an opportunity. So this is now an opportunity that you have in your life. Just by relabeling it, Dennis, let's have you jump in. How does it change? Yeah, you know, that's actually a, a word that I use all the time, too, is opportunity. And it, even when I'm facing something that is going to be very, very difficult, I do call it an opportunity. So I'm not sure where I picked that up from, but it's it's been pretty you know, much years now that I've done that, and it has made a difference in my life. Uh, in fact, a, a good friend of mine is actually um, helping me. You know, he listens to my radio show, and he's run recording studios for years. And he has been giving me some tips and ideas. And he one time told me, he said, you know, you got you to do like so-and-so does on their talk show. And, and I said, Dave, you know, I've, I've never listened to another talk show before, ever in my life. I never have. And he said, and you're running one. And I said, yeah. So I, I didn't see this as a, as a scary thing. I saw it as an opportunity. You know, this is, this is something new. We've been doing it for a year now. Uh, or if we're faced with, uh, with some financial challenge in our life or, uh, whatever it may be, I think opportunity does change your mindset. Uh, in my speech classes, I talk to our, the students about, I tell them that you need to try to think about what you're thinking about while you're thinking about it before you say it. Right. And that's that process of getting your mind in gear so that you're in charge of what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's powerful, and, and, you know, just by, you know, here's the interesting thing is that for most people, they probably couldn't jump from problem to opportunity. So, you know, what we did was what, what was just called chaining. We took you from problem to challenge to opportunity, sort of incrementally moving you through to a new mindset. The problem is most people just want to go from a negative mindset to a positive mindset, and they don't want to have to do any work or any, you know, middle steps in between. Sometimes we have to chain ourselves through things and take little baby steps towards something new. But here's the amazing thing about it is what I just described for you guys, going from problem to challenge to opportunity, that is the strategy of being an entrepreneur. That's the definition of an entrepreneur, somebody who looks at problems and sees opportunities. That's very true. Is that When you see, who, who is it? Uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Milton Berle. He said, uh, if opportunity doesn't knock, then build a door. Yeah. And it, it, it changes your thinking to realize, hey, opportunity is always knocking. you just got to get a door there. You, you've got to put yourself out there so that you're ready to go. Yeah. And that all comes down to mindset. You know, what's the difference between people who uh, – I love Harvecker. He's got a quote where he says, um, if the difference between successful people and average people is that average people in life, their attitude is ready, aim, 
aim, <laughs> aim, <laughs> and they never pull the trigger because they're so afraid of not hitting the bullseye that they never take a shot at the target. And the difference with successful people is their attitude in life is ready, fire, aim. Right. You know, they take a shot, they see what results they get, they adjust, and then they take another shot, and they just don't quit. And the only difference between people like that and the average person is mindset. What is it that pushes a person, even in the face of fear, to move forward? And, and you know, being an entrepreneur can be a scary thing, right? Like you said, starting a new, uh, you know, talk show. It was a brand new thing for you. You've never listened to one before. You're on a whole new venture. The problem is 90% of people in the world will look at you and say, Dennis, you're crazy. You're not. Well, I, I am. I am. But yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they would never dream of doing something like that themselves because there's so many unknown factors and there's so much fear. They're so afraid they can't hit the bullseye and do a perfect talk show that they wouldn't even take a shot at it. No, very, very true. Now, Maurice, uh, I want to ask you a question. You, you are the expert out there when it comes to speaking. And in my mind, you know, I, I've, I've never had, I've never attended any event ever that was as good as yours and a lot of what you do is help speakers learn how to think and prepare and organize the things that they're going to say ahead of time so you, you know you've you've been involved in and and you know Michael uh, what what parts of NLP do you feel that you use in in your uh, training of speakers well, you know Michael brought up uh, brought up the uh, phrase about re re changing our way of looking at things. Uh, you know, for example, don't look at it as a problem, look at it as not a challenge, but as an opportunity. Uh, same thing with public speaking. People are nervous about it. So what I suggest to people say, instead of being nervous, how about that thing that you feel in your stomach that you're excited about it? And another thing where I see there's a com uh, connection between L NLP and what I do is that program part. In other words, is there a template? Is there a schematic that I could follow? Is there a script uh, to bring in the linguistic side? Is there a script I could follow to get me to the to the end? In other words, the, the means will then justify the ends, and and that's what's about. I, I and that's what I'm picking up from Michael in that there's certain types of scripts we can use even for ourselves to help me to help me to be successful. Hey, hey, Maurice, I missed our cue. We're actually going and right into break right now. We're going to come right back. More information. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. This message has been brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Chris, can you put the video game controller down for a second? I can talk and play. Oh, I'm totally annihilating this punk kid in Nebraska. I just feel like you're not acting like a grown-up in our relationship. M2, M2! Well, you know, you still ride your skateboard to work, there's the comic book collection, the race car bed... Look, I'm young at heart, but I put money into my 401k every paycheck. I picked up a few savings tips at feedthepig.org. I have control of my financial life now, and that feels pretty grown up. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. For free ideas and easy tips on ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. So, I bet I look like a grown up to you now. Well, except for the footy pajamas, I'd have to agree. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Saturday Morning CEO Radio Show. We are so glad to have you in the air here, and uh, we have uh, we've got a couple callers that may be uh, having some questions for us here in a second too. But welcome back, Maurice. We cut you off, or we? Uh, I'm talking about me, myself, and I. All three of us cut you off rudely for our commercial break. So uh, you were talking a little bit about how NLP plays a part for speakers, and as you train speakers, do you want to continue from there? Uh, what I was saying is, and this is something that I learned uh, from Michael, in other words, the words that we choose. 
you know, there's definitely words we could choose that when we're speaking to uh, an audience, and it could be an audience of one or audience to many, and, you know, we could use trigger words for us, in other words, words that put us at ease, that calm us down, and things that we could do. Conversely, we could also use words that will, you know, persuade, let people see our point of view. So I'm a big believer, and that's why, in fact, I had Michael at my last uh, last intensive to talk about uh, those trigger words, those those persuasive words. And again, you know, we're not talking about having people jump up and down like chickens on the stage. You know, people will, and Michael, please, but, you know, here's a question for you. Uh, when it comes to hypnosis and NLP, what I heard is that people's subconscious will not allow them to do what, what they will not do. In other words, we could use all the persuasion we want if a person does not see our point of view or does not want to invest in us. They, they are not. Can you, can you elaborate on that? We're not hearing you, Michael. I think you might have uh, muted there. Sorry about, Sorry about that. No, we're good. You're back on now. Yeah, so if you could think of the conscious mind almost like a guard, like you would see at the palace, you know, their job is to keep you out from getting to that most important person, right, the, the decision maker, the queen. Your, your, your conscious mind is the only part of your mind that has the ability to accept or reject based on logic, but your subconscious mind actually has the ability to reject based on morals and values. This is one of the biggest misconceptions that people get when they watch stage shows is they see, you know, they see people on, uh, up on the stage who are doing all these crazy things and they say, well, nobody could make me do that. Well, the answer is, it's right. Nobody could make you do that. If you're not the kind of person who would bark like a chicken or stand on your head or, you know, do those crazy things on stage, there's nothing that stage hypnotist could say that would make you do it. So there's the answer to my question. It would work on me then. <laughs> <laughs> it would? <you> <laughs> I, I, I would be willing to do all those things. So <laughs> I see you doing all those things on break, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even need the hypnosis. But, you know, if, if we could translate that to neurolinguistic programming, NLP has often been described as hypnosis um, a while awake. And, and it's not technically true, but it is true that your, your subconscious mind is always listening. It's always aware. The whole notion of hypnosis was let's see if we can make your conscious mind go away. While, you know, your conscious mind is floating in a boat or in a mystical, magical forest or floating on a fluffy cloud, we're going to talk to your subconscious mind. Well, what the, the psychiatrist Milton H. Erickson taught us is that your subconscious mind is always listening. It's, it's never off. Even when you're asleep, it's protecting you. So the notion of neurolinguistic programming is how do we use language in an awake state to reprogram our minds to, to have success? And then, and then also use language so that we can communicate as effectively as possible with other people. No, oh, that's very important. Uh, language is, yeah, I, I love words. You know, I am a, a word jouster. Uh, I get a lot of practice, and I, I have fun with puns and all that. But there's, you know, there's a lot of thought process that goes into all that. Even though it's just for fun, uh, I realize that it's, uh, you know, there's a cognitive, a higher level of cognitive process where you have to, uh, just like I mentioned before, Think about what you're thinking about while you're thinking about it. Right. It gives you more control, doesn't it? Yep. Absolutely. So we, we talked last time, uh, and I'd kind of like to touch on it again in case we have some new listeners and viewers, too. We talked a little bit about the, the uh, subconscious uh, advertising yeah. and you know, in music and in, in video, and I actually uh, admitted, because I think I'm beyond the point that they could actually arrest me to <laughs> where I put a few frames of popcorn in at the end of a movie when I used to manage a movie theater and people were actually buying popcorn to take home. Yeah. So it was quite amazing. So can we subliminally or even consciously advertise to ourselves? Is that what we're doing? Absolutely. You know, and, and just speaking of advertising, you know, it's it's estimated now that we see more than thirty thousand advertisements a day on average. And uh, it's funny because when I first heard that statistic, I thought, no, that can't be true. That's just, that sounds like a gross overestimation. Then I started realizing how much advertising is around me. You know, it's so funny because it's become so much a part of our environment that we're almost not consciously aware of it. But when you're driving down the street, down the freeway, how many billboards do you see by the time you get home? You know, how many uh, commercials do you see on TV? How, every time a car drives by and it's got its little badge on the back, that's an advertisement for something. We're bombarded constantly by all these messages. And the question is, how do we 
get to a point where we're bombarding ourselves with our own messages. Um, you know, part of the problem, I think, in Western society is that we're taught to idolize the conscious mind, and we're taught to almost demonize the subconscious mind. There are all these social messages that we get, that by the time that you're, you know, depends on if you're a boy or a girl, but by the time you're 10, 11, 12 years old, you're supposed to put away the dollies, put away the G.I. Joes, stop your crying, you're a big boy now, you're a big girl now, ignore your emotions, get your feet on the ground, you know, and, and, and be grown up. And part of the problem is, I think, in that message, what, what we're really telling children is shut off your unconscious mind. Don't pay attention to your emotions, don't pay attention to your creativity, don't pay attention to your, um, your intuition. All of those things come from your subconscious. And so what happens is most people shut the door on their unconscious mind and they try to live their entire, their entire life with their conscious mind. And as I always say, that's like trying to win a poker tournament with just one card. You know, you can't even win a hand with one card, much less win an entire tournament. And so what we have to do is we have to learn how to unlock that door because the statistics show your subconscious mind is actually 99.96% of your entire mind. Well, that's uh, a Sorry, 99.94%. So your, your conscious mind that we try to think with and logically live our lives with is only 6 one thousandth of 1% of the entire mind. Wow. I, I, think, I think Maurice has a question for you here. Maurice? Yeah, Michael, I was just, I was just curious in that, uh, you know, you said we have 30,000 advertisements a day, plus we have the chatter in our head. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your feeling on mantras, uh, you know, that repetitive, in other words, actually talking to you, that 99.4% of the subconscious mind, yeah. uh, you know, speaking to that, that subconscious mind uh, to recreate n uh, new neural pathways? Is there any, is there any credence to mantras or repeating things over and over again? Yeah, yeah, you know, there's definitely, um, I think there's definitely a, a benefit to it. But here's how I explain it. In neurolinguistic programming, what we say is the words that you say are not so much the linguistics of the mind. Your mind is actually operating, your subconscious mind is operating on pictures, sounds, and feelings. It's the pictures that you hold in your head that define, um, you know, how you feel about things and how you process things. And, and it's the sounds, the, the words that you're saying to yourself in your mind and the sounds that you hear. Like, for instance, I, I had someone in my uh, childhood who used to say things to me that weren't so nice. And, and one of the, the common things was, um, you know, what are you, stupid? And that was a common phrase that I heard as a child over and over and over again. So by the time that I was a teenager, I thought I was stupid because I heard it so often. And that voice that was in my head wasn't even my voice. It was like an echo from the past. But every time that I would set out to do something, uh, like maybe start a new business or you know, try to do something, anything that was outside of my comfort zone, I would get this voice in my head that goes, are you stupid? <laughs> And that would hold me back. So it's the pictures and the sounds and the feelings ultimately the program us. The words can lead to that. But you know what I tell people is this. A lot of people say, what about affirmations? What about mantras? Well, if I'm saying every day in every way I'm getting richer and richer, but in my head I see myself living in destitute in a single wide trailer, that mantra is not going to do me any good. The words are not going to help me because my unconscious mind is just going to go, liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, why so do you this, know? What's that? You can't lie to yourself. No, you can't lie to yourself. So what you have to do is you have to start shifting yourself from the inside out. This is one of the biggest problems, I think, is that most people, when they set goals, they set what I call environmental goals. They say, I want a million dollars in my bank account, or I want, I want that special someone outside, you know, that special love of my life to come and find me. They're always looking for something that's outside of themselves for fulfillment. And their thinking is, as soon as I get that thing outside of myself, then I'll feel good. So let's take money for instance. People say, well, if I only had more money, then my whole life would be magical and all my problems would be solved. But, you know, statistics show that of years of studying people who've won the lottery, it doesn't matter if they win a million dollars or $20 million. The statistics show within two to five years, virtually every lottery winner is broke. Many of them are uh, depressed. Some of them are even suicidal. And the problem is that they thought the money... Something outside of them. You know, I, you may not know this, but I've been about 15 years working as an assistant in surgery, and I notice the same exact thing happens with, with plastic surgeon yeah. patients. 
So they think that by getting their face lifted or whatever it may be or tummy tucked, that they're going to be happy inside afterwards, and, and they usually aren't. And the funny thing is they're so sure that they're going to be happy afterwards that they get that nose job and they still don't feel good, so they go, well, now I have to go back and get my chin done. Right, yeah. And they still don't feel good, so they say, now i got to go back and get my stomach done. And and it's it's a never-ending. I mean, you end up with people, unfortunately, like Michael Jackson sometimes, who had so many surgeries, they say parts of his face were actually dying. Wow, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you got to have blood supply going there. Hey, right. i got a question from a caller. Uh, Mr. Alan Skidmore is on the air here. Yeah. So, hey, Alan, ask away, my friend. You might need to move. Hey, here we go. Hey, Michael, how you doing today? Great. How you doing, Alan? Doing well. Hey, we talked a while back. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, and it has to do along the same lines of your smoking, is that, you know, I've, I'm an overweight guy and, you know, concerned about losing some weight and everything. And what I've discovered is that part of it is, in my case, is just bad habits. I know that I, I'm, I'm always in a hurry to eat whatever just because I've got so much to do. And how, how do I take what you did or the, the, the methods that you used as far as like for stopping smoking to change some of the habits that I would need to do to change and, and improve my eating habits to not choose those quick things or drink the Coca-Cola or the fast food or things like that to focus more on the, on the better types of food that would help me to lose weight? Yeah, you know, what we find is that the, the, the number one component in weight loss is it's a subconscious component. It's what we call values. Okay. Your values drive all of your behavior. They drive everything that you do, and values are simply what's important to you. So one of my uh, clients that I worked with years ago, she was about 100 pounds overweight, and when I asked her, what is the most important thing about food to you, her answer to me was convenience. Yes. She was a, she was a, a mom. She was an executive uh, for a, a big company. She would work 10, 11 hours a day. Then she would come home, and her kids wanted food, and her husband was hungry, so she'd throw the kids in the minivan. She would drive to – the kids could never agree on where they wanted to eat, so they would always go to two different fast food places, and then the husband often wanted something else. So she's driving around for another hour after work just trying to get them food, and she said, she said whichever one is the easiest is what I will eat. Okay. Because convenience was the most important thing to her. And when I asked her how important health was, it wasn't important at all. So what we ended up doing was – really focusing on making health the most important thing about food. Okay. Look, look at somebody who um, is a runner, for instance, just switching to a different category. When you have somebody who's a runner, they'll run in the rain. Right. Yep. Because it's so important to them that there's no outside circumstance that would stop them. And the same thing is true with food. If you elevate health to be the number one most important thing about food to you, then what will happen is you'll actually find yourself taking extra time to cook things for yourself or prepare things for yourself. You'll find yourself going out of your way to find something healthy rather than taking a shortcut. And and so it's really, it's, it comes down to prioritizing values and, and focusing on making the most important thing the most important thing. Okay. Um, as soon as you do that, and then, you know, there's some things that you can do consciously, right? You can consciously just say to yourself, health is now the most important thing. And sort of like Maurice said, do the mantra thing and really focus on that. You'll get some traction with that. Okay. But if you know, if you can work with somebody who's you know NLP practitioner or uh, a hypnotherapist, I mean, there's even hypnosis, you know, CDs and, and MP3s you can get for it. Right. That can help. I got to tell you, probably the biggest thing though is to find a coach. Okay. That's what I would say. Okay. You know, to have somebody in your life who can help you stay accountable and who can help you stay on track and stay focused on what you want is one of the biggest reasons why people succeed. And you'll find that virtually every successful person out there has a coach. I have coaches. I just spent $15,000 on a coaching program myself. Why? Because coaching is that important to me. Okay. A lot of people look at that and they say, wow, that's an expense, 15000 No, that's an investment. It's an investment right. in myself. So right. the good news is weight loss coaches don't cost that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that helps. <laughs> That's very true. We've got a little over a minute here before we go to our, our final break. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about when we come back is, uh, Michael, you and I during our pre-show call with Maurice uh, talked a little bit about uh, these. You know, We've got these uh, what I call unplanned entrepreneurs that are starting up out there that yeah. they can't find a job. And if they're lucky, they still have a little bit of money that's, uh, in their investment plan from work if they're really lucky. And they're saying, okay, I need to start a business. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about the, uh, when we come back from break, we'll talk about the, uh, the opportunities that there are if someone wanted to be trained to be a, a certified uh, NLP 
expert or therapist or what? What's the correct word for that? Well, we usually call them practitioners, but either therapist or coach. Okay. So if, if somebody wanted to do that as a business, that's what I'd like to talk about when we come back from break. Uh, I just okay. want to, before we go to break, real quick, just remind everybody that if you're not uh, watching us on the on Twitter, you should because uh, Jay is following us along right now at uh, smradio.org/tweet. And you can ask a question on there if you'd like. Uh, you can also uh, watch us on smradio.org slash YouTube. Uh, or if you're in Riverside County in California, you can watch us on Channel 45, Verizon Fios, or Channel 0 or 126 on Time Warner Cable. So those are the places you can see us if you're only hearing us right now. We'll be back from break right after this. For the California Dental Association, Christy Yamaguchi. As an Olympian and daughter of a dentist, I know the importance of having healthy teeth and a bright, healthy smile. Tooth decay is the number one childhood disease, more than asthma and obesity. That's why a new state law requires that kindergartners receive a dental checkup. So parents, prepare your children for school. Take your child to see a dentist. It'll make you smile too. For more information, call 800-CDA-SMILE. Do you suffer from the heartbreak of brain rot? Feeling bored, sluggish, listless, not had a new idea in days? Using electronic gizmos without a clue why they work? Now there's help. Ham Radio, guaranteed to stimulate your corroding neurons and open a whole new world of excitement. To learn more about Ham Radio, go to helloradio.org. Side effects of Ham Radio usage include mental stimulation, desire for education, new career paths, understanding of technology, and cases of addiction have been reported. If you experience any of these symptoms, you're welcome. Ham Radio, it's not your granddaddy's radio anymore. They were outnumbered, out-equipped. They had no chance of winning, but they had one huge advantage, General George Washington. The fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. We have to resolve to conquer or die. Just as the leadership of one man helped form a nation, today leadership can transform the world. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. It's like FM without the commercials. It's like XM without the quality. It's AM 1620, the Eagle Radio Network. Welcome back to the Saturday Morning CEO Radio Show. We are so glad to have you here. And Michael Stevenson, one of my favorite uh, guests here, is uh, is back with us to talk to us about uh, neurolinguistic programming. And uh, we've talked about how it will help us mentally if we're running a business and all that. But if you're still trying to figure out what kind of business you want to run, this might be an idea for you: is to become a practitioner of NLP. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how that works? and how somebody gets started with that, if that's what they're interested in, Michael. Well, I'll tell you, it's one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. I, um, you know, I sort of got into this career, like you said, sort of accidentally. Um, I, I was a computer programmer making a very healthy salary. I had everything that they say should make you happy. Uh, I had the money, the house, the car, my kids in private school, and everything that I wanted, but I was miserable until I found out the joy of uh, helping people. And I found out the joy of really being in service and making an impact in somebody's life and helping them do something amazing. And, and that's what NLP has really helped me do. Um, when I became an NLP practitioner, I could now help people, for instance, lose weight, quit smoking, things like that. But I could also help people in business double and triple their income by helping them change their mindset and um, you know, really helping them program themselves for success. And you know, that's the thing. There's a big misnomer. A lot of people, as a matter of fact, I, I wore this T-shirt for you today, Dennis. Uh, this is a T-shirt that says, "I'm using NLP on you." I love that. I love that. So my comment on Facebook, I have to tell everybody here on TV and on the air, was uh, try printing that on your pajamas and see if you get the same response. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But you know, the the misnomer is that NLP is something that you do to somebody. 
The fact is, I can't program you, Dennis. I can't program Maurice. I can't program anybody else. The only person who can program you is you. You know, and this is the big misconception with stage hypnosis as well. Is those people who are on stage, the stage hypnotist isn't controlling them. They're still in control of themselves. And, and it's a big misnomer. The only person who can program your subconscious mind is you. I can walk you through it verbally, and I can help you achieve those results, but it ultimately is you. And, and I think that's the thing that most people don't realize is the power is always within you. So, you know, taking a course like a neurolinguistic programming practitioner course teaches you that programming language of the mind and how you can help yourself and other people to do that same thing. And Michael, I just a quick question. Uh, you said something about that you can't, you know, do this to me. I, I recently I heard that, you know, when it comes to motivation, we really can't motivate someone else. It's really that we, we are an inspiration. Yes. So when you become an NLP practitioner, when you get the certification or what have you, is that what you're doing? You're, you're teaching people uh, the, the ways of getting to their success? So if they want smoking sensation, you teach them the ways to, to do that. If they want to lose weight, just like what you did with Alan just a moment ago. Yeah. Explain to him, not so much you know, doing the voodoo on him, as it were, yeah. but more of what he needs to get done. Exactly. Exactly. And that and that's the thing is, you know, I I can't crawl inside of his brain. There's no control panel in there where I can grab a hold of switches and knobs and, you know, reprogram him. But I can uh, you know, I can verbally walk him through that process of changing his values and, and of uh, even changing identity. You know, this is one of the biggest things, identity. The words I am are the most powerful words in the universe. Right. Most people think I have to wait for money to flow in my life before I can call myself a millionaire. And that's why, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, so many of those people, they have a million dollars coming to their life, and two to five years later, it's gone. Because in their mindset, their mindset is still a poverty mindset. So you can put as much money as you want into their life, it's just going to disappear, or they're going to waste it, they're going to spend it poorly, or whatever. The difference is you take somebody like Donald Trump, regardless of what you think about the guy, he was $4 billion in debt. Right, And because he had a wealth mindset, he couldn't stay poor. Now, I know a lot of people these days are crying about, oh, my God, I have $30,000 in credit card debt. You know, it's the end of the world. <laughs> this guy has $4 billion in debt. And look at him now. You know, what's his net worth now? Like $6 billion, I think. Right. He, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I just remember he was walking with his wife into a, a, a town one time, and they had parked kind of far from where they needed to go, and they walked by a, a beggar. And uh, he said he turned and said to his wife, he says, "You know, I'm poorer than that guy right there." <laughs> yeah, but you know what? His mindset—if you look at Donald Trump's mindset—it's all wealth. And I don't know how much of that is for the camera, and you know, I don't know if he's any different off camera. But when you see him on camera, he is all wealth. I mean, even his his uh, hardware in his bathroom is is gold. <laughs> he's got gold sinks and gold. You know, um, he just has such a, a wealth mindset. Right, definitely. So, so what does it take to get started? I mean, it, there's. I notice there's different people that teach the course sure. uh, for NLP. I, w what should somebody look for to make sure that they're getting somebody good? And what kind of an investment are they looking at if they want to? And time, time investment and yeah. money investment to get a business started. Well, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to get a business started, you should probably look at an NLP practitioner training. Um, because it's a professional training, it's a professional certification, and they expect that you're going to make money off of it, they're a little pricier. They're usually around $2,000 to $3,000. Um, if you're only looking to use NLP in your own life, and you just want to learn some new mindsets and some mental tricks to help yourself you know, get better results, then there's, there's tons of places you go out there and not have that investment. I have a, a course called freenlphomestudy.com, and it's a great little intro that teaches you kind of how to run your own brain, how to turn off the autopilot, grab a hold of the controls, and, and, you know, consciously choose on a daily basis how your day is going to go. And I think it's something that most people in today's world are missing. Most people are living life on autopilot. And they feel like the events of the day are happening to them rather than feeling that they have any control over their own life. Yeah, good point. And, and Michael, can, can you say, what, what was the name of that site again? Because, again, in, in my field, and I'm sure people are listening, and, you know, uh, Dennis brought up a very good point that, you know, people are the accidental entrepreneur. You know, they, don't, they find themselves uh, needing to create that opportunity. So what, what was that site? 
It's www.freenlphomestudy.com. And with with that, I'm just I'm just curious. Do you need you know Do you have to you know? For some reason, I'm thinking the the traditional psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, that type of thing. You know, with the pipe and a, a smoking jacket and a couch. Uh, do I need all those accoutrements uh, no. to to be an L, NLP uh, practitioner? No, no. We've literally had our our youngest certified NLP practitioner was 16 years old. We've had people all the way up to you know. Uh, you know, in their 80s, we've had people who have an immense amount of, of uh, education to people who have minimal education. It, you know, the thing is, is that when you start learning the programming language of the mind, it's actually so simple that a child can do it. We, we've had, in my, in my personal development courses, we've had children as young as eight years old come in to learn how to start, you know, reprogramming their own mind for success and learning mindsets, you know, which I think is a great time to get to them. Right. You know, we got to start getting to these kids before society puts all these negative beliefs and negative thoughts into their head. There's so many out there, and, and you know they're what we call memes. A meme is is a term that was created by Richard Dawkins, and essentially it's a thought virus. Ah. When, when we have when we hear something and we hear it so often from society, we start to believe it. And um, you know, one of the most common memes because I, I deal with people a lot for for um, abundance consciousness. You know, there's a lot of people in a poverty consciousness right now. We're programmed by the news to believe that the economy is in shambles, that there's no money anywhere, that everybody's getting laid off. Well, some of that's true to some extent, but it's not true. You know, it's not true for everybody. The most important economy in the world is the one that's in your mind. There's people right now who are making a great living. There's people right now becoming wealthy in this economy right now. And then there's other people who just accept that there's no money out there and they believe that and they don't take any action. So, you know, the, again, it comes back down to mindset. We're so programmed by, like, the news and by family and by our educational system. And, you know, for instance, when it comes to money, one of the common beliefs that I hear people say all the time is money is the root of all what? Evil, right. And everybody can finish that sentence. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Jewish or not. We hear that statement so often that it becomes reality to us. And now the funny thing about it is there's not a single Bible on the face of the earth that says that. I've actually challenged people to bring the Bible in, and they've brought the Bible in, and they go, here's where it says it right here. And I say, read that sentence again, because it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. That's right. Now that's kind of a different message. Money is not evil itself. If I put money in a closet, it's not going to go do a bunch of evil in there. <laughs> Right? But the love of money could maybe drive you to doing some evil. But here's where it gets even more interesting for me is if you look at the res if you research where that statement came from, the original language it was written in, even that is a mistranslation. The original message was the worship of money is the root of all evils. In other words, elevating money above everything else, making it so important you're willing to do anything for it, is the root of evil. And that I can agree with. But that's not the belief that gets permeated through society. We just hear this over and over again. Money's the root of evil. Money's the root of evil. Money's the root of evil. And what happens is because our subconscious is a highly moral part of ourselves, it's high, it, it's, it has a very st strong value system, strong moral system. Your unconscious, even though consciously you say, I want a million dollars, your unconscious mind goes, but I don't want to be evil. Yeah, that's right. So this is, we see this a lot in society where people say, hey, I want to lose weight, but then they don't go to the gym. Or they say, I want to start a business, but they play solitaire all day. Or they say, I want to fall in love, but then they sit at home on the internet instead of going out and meeting people. And what happens is when your behavior is different than your, than your stated goal, that's what we call a subconscious conflict. And what we do as NLP practitioners is we help you eliminate that subconscious conflict so it no longer holds you back. I, I like that a lot. There's something I want to ask you too. That there is definitely results come from doing, but I want to talk a little bit about knowledge too. And, and that is that as, as I move forward in my life and try to figure out what things I want to do or, or grow in an area, the internet today is incredible. I mean, you can you can find out anything you want to find out. When I w wanted to find out how to do uh, some filming. You know, I watched and learned about three-point lighting and, and how to, there was a YouTube video on how to build a, a PVC lighting stand for $5. I mean, I, I learned this stuff. W would you suggest that if you're trying to set some new mindsets that you need to expose yourself to new knowledge also? Yeah. Well, what is the importance of that? 
I'm sorry? What is the importance of exposing yourself to new knowledge? It's, it's really important. You know, I think we're getting to a point where we're going to start um, using that term renaissance man or renaissance person, I guess would be more appropriate these days. You know, there were certain people in the past like, um, like uh, Michelangelo, for instance, you know, those, those renaissance men who knew everything about everything and they were the geniuses. Now, you know, they weren't necessarily, they didn't necessarily have more horsepower in their head than everybody else. They just had more knowledge. And for instance, uh, you know, one of the things I was going to do today, I was going to do a little thing about lock picking, but I realized not everybody's on the video. But um, you know, I'm a certified licensed locksmith. I carry my locksmith tools with me everywhere. People say, "How did you get into that?" I thought you were an NLP guy. <laughs> well, about eight years ago, I got interested in picking locks because every lock is like a puzzle, and I love puzzles. And so I was talking to a locksmith that got me interested in this. I signed up for a correspondence course where they would actually send me locks and, and, and broken locks and I had to make keys by filing keys down and I went through a whole course where I became a licensed locksmith. And people say, why would you do that? How would you ever use that in your life? Well, number one, I help people unlock their cars when they're stuck and it's a great feeling to do that, you know, just to help a, you know, a stranded mom or something like that. But number two, there are so many things I learned in locksmithing that apply to other areas of life. You know, as a computer programmer, I learned thinking strategies and I learned problem solving strategies that I apply in other areas of life. As an NLP practitioner, it teaches me things to know about business, about art. You know, everything that you learn, the most important thing is to realize that that learning will not stay in that context. Right. So you don't necessarily have to, I didn't have a reason to learn locksmithing. It was something that was interesting to me. I dove in and I learned so much from it. And it applies to other areas of life, all areas of areas of life. That's I have a, a orchard of fruit trees and I feel the same way. I can apply the you know, the growth and the the product and all that stuff from the fruit trees to life too. So mm -hmm. Maurice has a question for you. Yeah, I'm just wondering, as we're coming to a close here, Michael, uh, people that are interested in, in going to NLP or, you know, the accident, we made mention of the accidental uh, entrepreneur, is there is there anything that we could, you know, again, neuro-linguistically tell ourselves uh, to set ourselves up for success? You know, we are heading into the, the fourth quarter of the year. Yeah. I'm just wondering, as, this, as we're heading into the end of the game here, uh, uh, for the year, is there anything that we could share with ourselves so that we could set ourselves up for success and achieve that success? Yeah, um, I'll tell you, you know, one of the biggest things for me, I mentioned this earlier, is that identity is the most, it's the strongest part of the subconscious mind. It's the most core part of the subconscious mind. Who you are, who you identify yourself as. You know, I, um, I'm a man, I'm a dad, I'm a business owner, I'm an NLP person, I'm a speaker, I'm, I'm a radio show host. Whatever comes after the words I am is so powerful. And I alluded to this earlier. You know, most people are waiting for some sort of an external circumstance to happen in order to call themselves, for instance, a success, or to call themselves a millionaire, or to call themselves a business owner. You know, I just taught a course a few weeks ago on how to write books. I teach people how to, uh, how to write a book in 30 days or less, how to get it published, how to get it sold and marketed. And one of the things I told them right off the bat is the biggest reason that most people never write a book is because they say, well, I'm not an author. I'm not a writer. <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> Quit saying that because here's the thing. You have to call yourself an author first in order to produce a book. Most people think you have to produce a book in order to call yourself an author. And it doesn't matter what area of life. It doesn't matter if it's being a book. If you want to be a millionaire, you have to start thinking you're a millionaire first before you can have that million dollars come into your life. Good point. In fact, you can you can say I'm the author of the soon to be released book exactly. called such and such. Exactly. And I'm not necessarily saying you have to go out and tell other people you're an author if you've never written anything, right? We're not talking about falsifying information. I'm talking about who do you call yourself in your deepest thoughts, right? I had to become a business owner first in order to run a successful business. Most people think they have to have a successful business first before they call themselves a business owner. So it's putting the, you know, most people put the, the carriage before the horse. And it, if there's anything that you could do to make the rest of 2013 magical and 2014 amazing, it would be to put, you know, put them in the right order. Call yourself a success first and then wait for the results to show up or make the results show up. Don't wait for the results before you can call yourself what you what you already rightly are. And and it's such a big difference in the mindset. Um, I, I have a whole talk that I do about this about an hour long where I actually go into the different layers of the mind and, and identity is 
by far the strongest. So, you know, Alan, back to your question. What could you identify yourself as that would help you lose some weight? Um, how about this one? I am active or I am athletic, right? That would lead into maybe having more action and motion in your life. This is something that I did back when I wanted to start running. I started calling myself a runner first. I started calling myself active first and athletic first, and then I did it. Um, but you could even say, I am healthy. Right? And identifying yourself as a healthy person will actually start to create those values of health for you. So, you know, the beauty about identity is sort of a trickle-down effect. When you start changing your identity to a core level, everything else will trickle down and fall in place. You know, Maurice brought up a good point about it coming up towards the end of the year. And I, I think that's a mindset in itself because, yeah. you know, the last day of the year is just the day before the next day. It's just an arbitrary day, yeah. Right. So it, it, it's important, though, that we do focus on these things and, and realize, that, hey, let's call this something. This is a big event. This is our last quarter. Yep. You know, and, and we're in our last three and a half minutes of this show. So, you know, let's talk about, uh, as we get ready to end here, you've talked about the importance of identity and, and thinking right. Well, how, how can people get in touch with you? How can they become part of your training programs? Uh, and why would, why would they want to? I mean, what, how can it change their life? Can you share some of that with us as we uh, finish up here? Absolutely. The easiest way to get in touch with me is my main website, which is transformdestiny.com. Uh, that website links to everything else that we've got. It's the core website. And we really we have two kinds of trainings. We have one kind of training is what you alluded to before, which is the professional certification training. If you want to learn how to do this in order to be a coach or in order to help people lose weight or achieve something, then you can become certified in it. We have those courses on the website. They're online distance learning coaches. So you actually get to learn them from home. There's no traveling involved. Um, and then the other side is the side where I'm teaching people how to use this in their own life and their own business. And so we have courses like The Power to Create Your Life Now, which teaches you how to release everything from the past that has ever held you back. We teach you how to get rid of all your angus, all your anger, all your sadness, all your fear, all your hurt, guilt, obliterate it, wipe it out. Now. Uh, and um, i got to tell you, those are the things that hold people back. Yeah. Well, uh, th that's definitely uh, something that I, I actually, thank you, by the way, for doing your, uh, your free NLP training course. I've actually downloaded it and had, haven't had the time to, to uh, you know, get it in, into my brain yet, but yeah. I'm very excited about doing that because I have been an, a very big hobbyist on uh, NLP for many, many years. So so we appreciate you being on our show. And uh, did you have any final thoughts, uh, Maurice, before we uh, sign on out of here? No, I just, I'm a big believer in that whole talking your way into success, neural linguistic programming. So and let me tell you something, Michael is definitely the expert. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, check him out, check out his site. Uh, he's the hardest working uh, presenter I know, uh, a quality, quality information. So I'm so glad to be the co-host today with Michael as our guest. Hey, thanks for being on the air today, Maurice. And, and you're getting married pretty soon, aren't you, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, congratulations then, Eric. Thank you. Well, listen, as we sign off, we've got one minute here, so I just want to go through and uh, remind you all that uh, come back next week and see us. Uh, every Saturday morning, we've got a new guest for you at 8 o'clock in the morning, Pacific Time, on, and I'll run through these again, we're everywhere. So if you're in Europe, we're on satellite radio. Uh, if you're anywhere in the world, you can get us at smradio.org slash audio, and you can watch us on on uh, the computer too at smradio.org slash YouTube. Uh, we thank MJ for tweeting along with our show today. We appreciate all the nice little uh, snippets of uh, information that she's been sharing there. Uh, if you're in Riverside County, California, Verizon Files, thank you for airing our show. We appreciate it. We're on channel 45 and Time Warner Cable, channel 0 and 126. So join us. Those channels, by the way, are 24-7 and play a lot of the old movies and TV shows that we used to enjoy. So until next week, we love you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, guys. Today's lottery draw. And today's winning numbers are not yours, not yours, and another number that's not yours. And the final number is not When it comes to having brew your own coffee at home instead of buying that latte, brown Instead of ordering it, go to feedthepig.org for more free ideas on how to save. Feedthepig.org.
This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council.